Hey guys, it's Alex. Welcome to our lesson number 30 for confirmation class for Tuesday, May 5th, 2020. Uh, what you'll need for today is your workbook, a Bible, and a pen or a pencil so you can write with. We'll get started on page 121 in your confirmation workbook. Page 121. We're doing lesson number 30, Revelation and Conclusion. This is our last lesson in the workbook. Uh, but for those of you who are year two confirmation students, you'll have a couple more lessons left with us. And of course, there will be a unit test after this too, for everybody. <laughs> uh, but for now, we'll just get going with this lesson on page 121. The end of the world. How do things like fiction movies and books show the end of the world coming? Take 30 seconds to write down as many uh, ways the world ends in movies and books as possible. So, how have you heard people talk about the end of the world? What kind of things have you heard people say about it? What's going to happen? Anything you can think of, just jot it down there. Take a moment to do that. And there have been a bunch of movies made about the end of the world. Um, but I think a lot of the things that people say are like super scary things happening like earthquakes and tsunamis and uh, fire and just a whole bunch of scary mess of stuff. That's, that's mostly what I've heard. <laughs> I don't know if that's you guys. Um, we're actually going to talk about the end of the world today. And it might not be what you think. Uh, in today's lesson, the last of this series, we see how God ties his narrative of salvation together by showing us a vision of how this world will end and how the new creation will begin. So, the big picture in that red box on page 121. After Paul's final missionary journey, the narrative of scripture comes to a close. Tradition tells us that Paul went to Rome and was executed there for his faith along with Peter. In fact, tradition tells us that all the disciples were killed for their faith except John, who, who uh, to whom God gives a vision at the end of his life. So I want you to take your pen or pencil and underline John, to whom God gives a vision at the end of his life. That is important. Uh, and we'll keep on reading. This is the book of Revelation. The disciples, however, did not give up their faith. Jesus himself told them that they would have to suffer even death for him to follow in his footsteps. They all knew that no matter what happened in their lives as they preached the gospel to the world, Jesus had a future for them both in heaven then and in the new creation at Jesus' return. This, too, is our Christian hope. We've been called by the gospel, given faith through the Holy Spirit, and baptized into Christ. Because Jesus fulfilled all of God's promises for us, he is the main character of our stories. He died on the cross to forgive our sins, rose to promise us new life, and is coming again to make all things new for his people. This section is contained in the book of Revelation, written by the Apostle John. And the book of Revelation was written around A.D. 95. So we are in that last part of our timeline there at the very bottom. Pretty exciting stuff. We'll move on to page 122. Digging deeper. Setting up the ending to the narrative of salvation. So uh, we're going to read those paragraphs there. You can follow along. Revelation is the last book of the New Testament and the last book of the Bible. In it, we catch many glimpses of what has already happened in the past and get a picture of how the very end of the narrative of salvation will come to pass. Before we jump to the end, we need to take a look. Uh, we need to take a good look at what has come before. This is the narrative of salvation and God's promises. So, really, the whole narrative of the Bible has been leading up to this point. Um, everything. Everything is still important. Everything comes to play because it all tells the narrative of salvation. And then Revelation is the ending to that narrative of salvation. 
Um, next paragraph, look over the timeline below. So I put that in the PowerPoint too. Uh, and read each of the Old Testament Bible verses at critical sections. Each one is a promise of the Messiah, the one who would save the world from sin, death, and the devil. Read and review each promise. Then in the space below, find a creative way to represent the promise of the Messiah. It could be a sketch, a written statement, or a combination of those. Or, together with your leader, come up with your own idea. Record or represent some keywords or ideas for each one of the promises of the Savior that help describe who he is or what he does. And when you're done, share it with the class. So, what we're going to do... Since we're not in class together, this is a little harder. We're going to go through each of the Bible verses mentioned in this timeline. And then I want you guys to just jot down some words or thoughts or pictures that come to mind when we talk about these things. Um, so I'll give you some ideas about what you can maybe write. And then just make sure to write them down in your book so you get a good idea of the narrative of salvation and what these verses are talking about throughout the Bible. Um, the main point, though, the whole Bible is filled with promises of the Messiah, of Jesus, to come. So even before Jesus came, there were all these promises of Jesus. And after Jesus came, there were all these promises of Jesus. The promises of the Messiah are written throughout all of Scripture because Jesus really is the center of the entire Bible. Jesus is the center of everything. Uh, so we're going to start at the very beginning of our timeline there on the left side of page 122 with that uh, Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. So I uh, put it there on the slide so you don't have to look it up in your Bibles because it's right there. And we'll read it together. Uh, so, the Lord, so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Um, so this is what God says to the serpent. If you remember back from our one of our first lessons there, uh, this was the, the fall of man. So Adam and Eve sinned when they ate the forbidden fruit from the tree. Um, but the serpent was the one who kind of tricked them into eating that. And so this is what God said to the serpent afterwards. Um, he's cursing him. And then the key part I want you to look at is right here. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This may seem confusing. Um, so I will put enmity. Enmity is like a division um, between you, between the serpent, and the woman. The woman is actually Eve. Um, and between your offspring, so children of the devil, and her offspring. Who's Eve's offspring? Ultimately, this is actually talking about Jesus. He will crush your head, so Satan will wound Jesus, uh, and you will strike his heel. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that backwards. He will crush your head. So Jesus will crush Satan's head, and Satan will strike Jesus' heel. So uh, Jesus, we know, ends up being wounded on um, the cross. He ends up dying for our sins, and that is uh, the serpent striking his heel. But if you look, he will crush your head. So ultimately, Jesus wins. He's the one who crushes Satan altogether. Um, so this is what God is telling to the serpent you know, even way back in Genesis, at the, at the very beginning, God knew this was going to happen. And he's saying that Jesus, you know, the offspring of the woman, which is Jesus, will ultimately crush you. And so from this, we really get the picture that Jesus is a conqueror. He's like stronger than Satan. Even though Satan has, you know, would wound him, he's, he's still stronger than him and he will defeat him. Um, so that is the, uh, the picture of the, the promise of the Messiah that we get here. That one day, the offspring of the woman, Jesus, will come and crush Satan. Which we know that Jesus did. <laughs> we'll go to our next point in the timeline. Which is, if you look there, next to the cane there, or right above it, 
Uh, there's Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Um, this is God talking to Abram, um, Abram whose name was later changed to Abraham. Um, God gives him this promise. He said, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So this is God's promise that he's giving to Abram. Um, there were a couple things that we went through this um, when we went through the story back a while ago when we did Genesis. Uh, but I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. So he's promising him blessing um, that he'll make him into a great nation so that he'll have um, offspring, they will have kids, and um, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. This last part is important. Because how are all the people on earth going to be blessed through Abraham? How in the world is that going to happen? Well, Abraham has kids. He, he, um, God makes him into a great nation um, through his offspring. And it's actually through Abraham's offspring that all the people on earth will be blessed through. Um, and Abra that offspring that it's talking about is Jesus. So all the world will be blessed through Abraham's offspring, which is Jesus. Um, you know, obviously not his immediate offspring, not his son, but like Jesus descended from Abraham. Um, and so that's how, through Abraham's line, all of the world will be blessed. Um, and that's a promise that God is making here. And that is one that uh, came to fulfillment through Jesus. Um, so when Jesus came, all, all of the world is blessed by Jesus. And so, therefore, all of the world will be, is blessed through Abraham because uh, Jesus comes from Abraham's line. It's pretty cool. <laughs> So we see that Jesus is really um, a blessing, and that it's that promise of the Messiah that we get here uh, in this story. We'll move on to the next part, which is with Moses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18, verses uh, 15 through 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him, I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. So what is this talking about? Well, uh, this is God speaking to Moses um, about a prophet that's to come. He says, I will raise up for, uh, for them a prophet like you, like Moses, um, from among their fellow Israelites. Now, Israel would have many prophets after Moses. There will be many people who will rise up and speak of God. Um, and this does speak about them, you know, but ultimately Jesus comes and he's the new prophet and teacher for everyone. So it, it kind of, it talks about those prophets, but also more so about Jesus uh, as well, um, that Jesus will come to be a prophet and teacher to everybody. And that uh, he will tell him everything I will command him. And God will call everyone uh, to account who does not listen to Jesus' words. Um, because what Jesus says is important. <laughs> we should listen to it. <laughs> uh, so this is the uh, promise of the Messiah that we get in Deuteronomy. That Jesus will come to be a prophet and teacher. We'll go on to the next part of the, the timeline, which is uh, with... Second Samuel, chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. 
Um, this is God talking to David. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So this is God talking to David, um, King David. <clears throat> and he's talking about his offspring. Um, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. So we know that David has a son Solomon, and Solomon becomes king after him. We also know that ultimately, Jesus comes from David's line. Um, we know that Jesus descends from David. Um, so, it kind of talks a little bit about Solomon, but more so even about Jesus. Um, so we know that uh, he's the one who will build a house for my name. So we know that Solomon's the one who builds the temple um, for God. But even more so, this is talking about um, a house for my name is just talking about establishing God's kingdom. And that is ultimately what Jesus came to do, was to establish God's kingdom on earth, uh, the kingdom of God on earth. Um, and so Solomon built a house for God, but so did Jesus. <laughs> um, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So um, God's kingdom will reign forever. Um, and then this part, when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Um, so this specifically is talking about Jesus because we know that Jesus uh, endured much suffering um, and his, uh, through his persecution and death on the cross. Um, so uh, this is a very uh, specific uh, relation to Jesus here, uh, reference to Jesus that it's talking about. Um, and ultimately, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So um, David's on God's side. And so um, God's kingdom will be established through David's kingdom, ultimately, which is pretty cool. Um, that he's foreshadowing Jesus coming um, through David's line. And um, so we kind of get this image of Jesus being a king like David. Now, it's not quite the king that people were expecting, uh, but nevertheless, Jesus is king because he's ruler of all, and he establishes his kingdom on earth, which is a different kingdom than, we're, than people were used to seeing back then, uh, but it ends up being the most important kingdom, um, kingdom that still exists today. <laughs> um, that's the promise of the Messiah that we get here. We'll go on to the next one, which is in Daniel. Um, Daniel actually has a little bit of prophecy in it, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So normally when people think of the book of Daniel, they think of Daniel in the lion's den, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which we, we talked about all that before. But Daniel, book of Daniel also has some really cool prophecies in it, including this one, um, which is this vision. Um the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. So it's an image of the Son of Man being Jesus. Um, and Jesus was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. So one day, uh, everyone's going to worship Jesus and bow down to Jesus. Um, his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Um, so we know that the kingdom of God can never be destroyed. Um, and that 
Jesus has dominion over that. He has that power and authority, um, which is pretty sweet. So we see this image of Jesus being in power and Jesus um, having dominion over um, over everything in God's kingdom. Um, so this is the promise of the Messiah that we get here in Daniel. It's an image of Jesus um, as having dominion, as having that, that rule. Uh, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, in the Gospels, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and verses 9 through 14. All right, bear with me on this one. It's kind of long, but it's cool. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that, uh, that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a, a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this is the very beginning of John's gospel. This is how John starts off his gospel, uh, which is a strange way to start uh, because it doesn't actually jump into the story, but it, it kind of does. It, it's just a little more poetic than the other ones. I kind of like that about John. Uh, but it's talking about Jesus here, and it might not be obvious at first. Uh, it's talking about in the beginning was the Word. And when it, whenever it says the Word, it's actually talking about Jesus. The Word was with God, so we know that Jesus was with God. And the Word was God, so we know that Jesus is God. Um, he was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. So Jesus was there at the start, at creation. Um, without him nothing was made that has been made. So everything... That was made was made with him so jesus was there he was a part of creation um or he was active in in you know that creating um he was with god um and he was god <laughs> uh in him was life and the light of all mankind um, so we get this image of jesus as being life and light oops um the true light that gives light to everyone. Um, so we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. Um, and life. Um, <laughs> so we see that he's life, he's light, he's... Um, yeah. And then this part, he came to all which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So this is talking about when he comes to the world um, and the world rejected him, right? They had him crucified. Um, but to those who did receive him, to people who follow him, um, those who believe in him, he gives the right to become children of God. Um, which is what we become, because we believe in Jesus. Um, born of God, which is awesome. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's when Jesus uh, took on flesh and lived in the world with us. So that is the image of Jesus. We get this, this picture of Jesus who actually is God becoming human flesh and living with us, which is awesome. <laughs> um, we get this picture of him as word, light, and life. Um, there's a lot that you could write down for this one. <laughs> uh, but this is a promise of the Messiah that we get right here in John's Gospel. We'll go to the next one. In Galatians... One of the epistles. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. 
Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So I, this is one of my favorite verses. I, I love this. Um, it's talking about Jesus being our redeemer. Um, you know, at the right time, God sent Jesus, his son, born of a woman, born of Mary, um, under the law to redeem those who were under the law, to redeem us, um, to be our redeemer, um, so that we could be adopted into God's family, so that we could become God's children. Um, and as God's children, we receive God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, um, into our hearts. And it's through that spirit that we can call upon God um, and we can call out Abba, Father, um, which is like calling to God very affectionately, like, like he's our father, because he is our father. Um, so that we're no longer slaves, but God's child. We can call out to God and we have, because um, we're God's children, so God, God will listen. Um, and then we have God's spirit in us, too. Um, since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Um, and so that means we receive that inheritance of uh, heaven with Jesus. <laughs> so here's the uh, promise of the Messiah that we get in Galatians. Uh, it's that picture of Jesus as a redeemer, the one who came to save us, the one through whom we are adopted into God's family. So there's a lot of pictures. We just went through seven Bible verses on the timeline. You should have something written down, something drawn, written for each one of those um, so that you can get a good idea of the promises of the Messiah that we get throughout the whole Bible. Um, so just make sure that you have some stuff written down for each one. Uh, make sure you understand it. Look good. There's a lot here. It's all, it's all great. I love it. Um, we'll now move on to Revelation. So... Uh, Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It's a book of prophecy, and it's written by John the Apostle. Um, so that John who lived and walked with Jesus uh, on earth. Um, and it describes visions that God gave to John of things that are now happening and things that are to come in the future. So God gives John these visions uh, and John writes them down, um, and they're all uh, they're prophecies of, of um, things that are to come and things that are now happening. And so John writes them down, uh, and that's how we get the book of Revelation. So right now I'm going to ask you to stop the video, pause it, and go and watch those uh, two, two videos I uh, from Phil uh, Vischer's What's in the Bible series. So I sent them to your parents. Uh, I'll also include them in the description on this video, so you can click the links there. Uh, go and watch those two videos, and then come back here, and we'll finish up the lesson. So uh, make sure to come back when you're done watching those. So you can go ahead and click pause now, and then come back when you're done. All right, welcome back. You should have watched those two videos from Phil Vischer's What's in the Bible series. They were just kind of an overview about what Revelation is about. They were a little goofy, but I thought they were kind of fun to watch. Uh, so I thought you guys might enjoy them. Um, the first video uh, talked about how Revelation is kind of a confusing book. Uh, how some people want to skip Revelation because it's confusing. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, it's just kind of a, a book people like to avoid. Um, but it's important, and so it has good things in it that we should pay attention to. It's important that we don't skip over it just because it's different from the rest of the books or it's a little harder to understand. It actually has some really important things in it. Um, so, And then the other video talked about symbols and how Revelation has a lot of symbols in it. Now, this is important to note. Uh, Revelation is not a book that we 
take literally uh, because of the because of the type of literature it is. It's a book of prophecy. There are parts of the Bible that we do take literally, and it's important that we take those books literally, um, that we interpret them exactly the way that they're written, um, that we interpret it literally. But because this is a prophecy, and because of the way this book is written, it's very clear that these are not literal things, that these are more of symbols. And so we try to interpret them as symbols um, rather than as literal things. Um, and there's more meaning to those symbols that we get through that. Um, so the symbols, if you don't really know what they mean, it can look kind of confusing at first. Um, there's a lot of numbers, a lot of symbols that we don't really use anymore, but that would have made more sense um, back then, that they used a lot more then. Um, but they, you know, once you learn them, it, it starts to make Revelation make more sense. <laughs> so there are a lot of symbols. And through interpreting those symbols and through reading this book, you can understand what it means. Um, it kind of gives us a picture of a prophecy that God gives to John. So it's an important book. It can be confusing, but we're just going to do a little overview of it. We're not going to get too deep into those symbols, so don't get too worried. Um, it won't get all that confusing today. I just wanted to give you an overview of the book so we can learn what what is it about and what's in it. So we'll start with, uh, it's the red box on page 123 of your workbook. It says, what's the deal with Revelation? We'll read that paragraph together. Revelation is unique in the New Testament as it is the only book pure uh, of pure prophecy. It looks a lot like Ezekiel or Daniel in the Old Testament, and it's the last book of the Bible. In it, Jesus came to his old friend, John, the disciple, one last time in a vision. By this time, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans, the other disciples had been killed for their faith, and John was a very old man, likely living out his last days. Read Revelation 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 19. So we'll read that together. Uh, pull out your Bibles and open up to G uh, Revelation 1. We'll read verses 9 through 19, keeping in mind that this is uh, full of some symbols and it's a vision that John is getting, where Jesus appears to him. All right, starting at verse 9, so you can follow along in your Bible. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was sent in, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to seven, the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Pergamum uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Um, so, if you couldn't tell, that uh, was Jesus that appeared in the vision to John. 
Um, it was a lot of weird imagery. They tried to describe, or John tried to describe what Jesus looked like, what he was seeing. Um, it mentioned seven lampstands. It mentioned a sword coming out of his mouth. Um, a lot of a lot of interesting things in there. Uh, if you ever want to do a fun activity, you could try to draw it. <laughs> um, but this is a picture I found of what it might have looked like. Um, but it's yeah, it's some some interesting symbols and imagery here. Um, but we're going to pay attention to what Jesus says. So, in your book there it asks, according to Jesus, what is the purpose of this vision? Uh, so if you'll notice, Jesus, in that first part, at, uh, in verse 11, he told John to write it down, to write down the vision that he's getting, and to send it to the seven churches... Um, and then it lists seven churches in different cities. The Philadelphia that it mentions is not the Philadelphia that's near us. It's a, a different one. Um, but a question you might wonder is why why just seven? Why seven churches? Why not all the churches? Because there were a lot more churches than just seven. And the seven there kind of represents completeness, like wholeness, uh, kind of represents all of the churches. So specifically send it to those churches, but also... This is a message that is meant for all churches. Um, that's kind of a one of the imagery things there with the seven. Um, so uh, it's a message, and it's, it's an important message to send to seven churches. But what is the purpose of this vision that he's getting? Well, if you look in verse 19... Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So this vision is going to be showing John what is happening now and what will take place later. So it's a prophecy from God about things that are already happening and things that haven't happened yet but will happen. Um, a little combination of both of those things. Some, some things that are going to happen, some things that are already happening. Um, it's an interesting kind of prophecy. Um, so that's the, the purpose of the vision, is to show those things, to show what is now and what will take place later. And also to spread that to the other churches, to spread that to the church throughout the world. To, um, that's why he's asking John to write this down, because it's important, even for us today. <laughs> um to show what is now and will take place later, and also to comfort God's people as they await the return of Christ. Um, that's an important role that Revelation plays for us today. Uh, as we read this book, um, even though it may seem confusing, ultimately it gives us comfort as we await the return of Christ. Um, we'll go on to that next part in the box. It says, There is a lot of confusion about all the visions that happen immediately after Jesus' letters to the seven churches. Quickly page through Revelation chapters 4 through 20. What is one thing that sticks out to you? So I thought that was a lot of chapters to just kind of skim through. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll help you out and give you the gist of what's happened in there. Um, so Revelations 4 through 20 kind of goes through three different visions that uh, John gets. And they kind of portray the same thing in three different ways. Um, and the ultimate message here is that Jesus is coming back um, to make all things new. Um, so we know that Jesus ascended into heaven, right? He died, he rose again, he spent some time with his followers, and then he ascended into heaven. Um, and then he sent the Holy Spirit. Uh, but one day, we live now with the Holy Spirit, but one day Jesus will actually return to earth. And that is what these visions are talking about. That's what these visions are showing, is what's going to happen when Jesus returns. And we know that when he does return, that'll be what we call the end times, or the last day, uh, is what a lot of people refer it to as, the last day. So um, it talks a lot about what happens in the end times, which is leading up to that last day, and then what happens on that last day when Jesus comes. Um, so when Jesus comes, he'll make all things new again, um, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and we'll all get to party with Jesus in heaven. It'll be really great. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, I meant to. Let's read this last paragraph. Uh, people try to read a lot into this, but Lutheran Bible scholars agree that Revelation 4 through 20 show three visions of the same thing in different ways. Each one shows how Jesus on the cross fulfilled God's promises and how Satan, in this time before Jesus comes again, attacks and threatens God's people. He cannot win the war, and Jesus is the victorious king, but Satan is can still make things difficult for God's people. The spectacular ending of Revelation, however, is on the next page. So one important point I want to highlight here is Satan cannot win the war. Jesus is the victorious king. Um, another interesting thing is we're actually in the end times right now um, a little bit. So a lot of what is happening, what we read about in Revelation is already happening now um, and it kind of reminds us that the end is near that that Jesus is coming soon um, and that's not a bad thing that's a good thing actually <laughs> but um, you'll see um, more of that as we go on uh, and then that last sentence in the red box there says when else in the narrative of salvation have God's people needed comfort from God in their suffering so we've gone through almost the whole Bible at this point. Um, there's a lot of times when people are suffering. So if you can think of any of those times when people have needed God's comfort, um, and just jot some of those down, where in the Bible have you seen people in need of comfort from God? There's plenty of examples that you could pick from. But ultimately, wherever there is suffering, we know that God is our comfort. Um, God is there to comfort us through everything that we go through, um, through all of our suffering, um, for, for everyone. So, um, and that is what we'll get in the book of Revelation, is that um, even through all of these prophecies, these prophecies serve, they're, they're a comfort to us, um, because we know that Jesus is coming again. Um, as we await for Jesus to return, these prophecies are a comfort. So it's not meant to be scary. A lot of people try to make Revelation sound really scary. Um, it's scary for people who don't believe in God because, you know, we, we know that they don't go to heaven. They go to hell. Um, so for those people, it is scary. It should be. But for us who do believe in God, we know that we have eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. So thinking about Jesus returning and that the end times, the last day when Jesus comes again, that's actually really exciting because I can't wait for Jesus to come. <laughs> that means that means we get to go to heaven. We get to live with Jesus. It's going to be so great. So for us, it's a comfort to read the book of Revelation. Uh this is not in your book, but I wanted to take some time to talk about this uh, because it seems like a really prevalent thing right now. Uh, with the coronavirus happening, there have been some people saying, well, it must be the end of the world. It must be, you know, Jesus is coming. Every, everything is happening now. It's, it's all the end of the world. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there's a lot, there's been some people who are, who are saying that. And um, it might raise some concern, like, are they right? Is this true? Is this is is this happening now? Is this the end of the world? Um, well, it turns out some of the people who say those things don't actually know what they're talking about. Um, they're trying to create panic. They're trying to say things that God didn't actually say. Um, and so some people try to spread false information, but we look to the Bible for truth. So what is actually happening here? Where does that even come from? What What is true here? So I wanted to uh, point out a couple of verses. This one is from Matthew chapter 24. This is Jesus talking about the last day, talking about when he will come again. Um, and he says about that last day, um, but about that day, uh, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So, um, the main point about this is no one knows when the end is. No one knows when that last day is going to be. And so people saying that it's happening now, people saying that the coronavirus means that this is it, um, they don't know what they're talking about because no one knows when the end is. 
So people claiming that they know when it's going to happen, people saying, oh, it's going to happen on June this day, or people saying it's definitely going to happen in 2020, they're lying. They don't know because no one knows when it's going to, when it's going to happen except for the Father, God the Father. Uh, another verse I wanted to point out, this is from Luke chapter 21. This is Jesus talking, and he's explaining what's happening in the end times. Now, the end times are the period of time before that last day when Jesus comes again. And it's things, uh, the end times is actually right now, but it's a period of time before Jesus comes again. And Jesus is explaining some of the things that are going to happen. So he says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences, uh, which is like diseases, in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your head because your redemption is drawing near. So Jesus is saying these are the things that are going to happen towards the end. Um, and if you look, these are things that have happened already. These are things that we've seen in our world, um, nations rising against nations, so like wars and things, um, battles, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, we've gotten those, famines, pestilences, diseases, right? Um, so all these things are happening um, towards the end. Um, but Jesus says, you know, they, they may sound like scary things, but when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So it's not really a thing to fear when things like this start happening um, because these things just remind us that our redemption is drawing near. And that's a good thing. Um, they remind us that Jesus is coming again soon. We don't know when, but we know it's soon. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting thing. We don't know exactly when he's coming. Um, but when things like this start happening, it only reminds us that Jesus is coming. Um, so it's an important thing for us to remember, not to lose hope, because Jesus is coming again. All right, so now you know what to say if someone uh, asks you if this is the end, if people start saying he's coming, he's coming in June or July or in the next couple of months, you'll say, you don't know what you're talking about. We Nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows when. We just know that our salvation is near. Um, redemption is drawing near. Um, but we don't know when. <laughs> All right, moving on. We'll go to page 124. That last page there, ending at the beginning. As we've seen, the Bible is an amazing library of 66 books written over a period of some 1,500 years by dozens of authors. Even with all this, it tells one narrative, God's plan of salvation. What is salvation? It is a restored creation. God created all things good. Look back or think back to Lesson four, around the image of the tree, write down some words that describe what the first creation was like for human creatures. So if you turn back in your book, you can go ahead and turn back to page 17 through 20. Pages 17 through 20, that is where we did lesson four, where we talked about creation. And so just take a look back at those pages uh, so you can remember what we talked about how God created the world. Um, and think about what the world was like when God first created it. How did it actually look? How was it different than how it is right now? Um, and we're going to write some things around the tree there. We know that God created everything to be good, right? Remember when uh, at the end of each day, he said it was good, which is pretty cool. Um, beautiful. God created this perfect creation. It was, um, and it was all created by God, who is good, and creates beautiful things. Sinless. So this was before the fall of man. This was before Adam and Eve sinned. So no sin had come into the world yet. So everything was without sin. I mean, we know that sin had many, many consequences, which were not good, and it brought about many not good things, but when, when things were without sin, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> no sin. And then the last one, perfect. That's one word that comes to mind for me. 
Um, just because there was no sin, nothing bad had come into the world yet, so everything was perfect. So, um, we'll read that next paragraph in your book. But we also know that mankind fell into sin. We disobeyed God and lost that perfection. Because of this, sin came into the world, and with it, death. So draw an X over your tree in those words that you wrote down. A big X across of it because sin was the end of that perfectness. It brought evil into the world. Um, and so there was all this bad evil um, that distorted creation. And so now what we have is a creation that's still from God, but it also has some bad things in it too that aren't from God, that are because of sin. We'll read that last paragraph there. Um, but God promised to send a Messiah who would restore his creation. The narrative of salvation is really about God's people waiting for God to fulfill that promise. The people kept rebelling, resisting, and being unfaithful to God. God was always faithful to them. To them. Jesus came to restore all things. Um, so this is ultimately what Jesus does. Jesus uh, came to restore all all things, that, that brokenness of creation, that sinfulness that was brought into creation with sin um, and evil that we have in creation now, Jesus came to restore it, um, to restore all things to God the Father. Um, so even though we messed up, God didn't give up on us. Um, Jesus came to restore all things so we can get back to that good and perfect creation of God. But it's not quite going to be like it was in the beginning. It's going to be a little bit different because it'll be a new creation. So now we're in that red box on page 124. When we die, our spirit is separated from our body. In heaven, our spiritual selves will be happy with the Lord. But we will be awaiting the final day when Jesus returns and restores our spirits to our perfected and remade bodies. And we will live on a new earth forever. So this is something some people get confused. When we die, our spirit is separated from our body, and uh, we get to go to heaven, um, and we get to be with the Lord. But on the final day, we wait for the final day when Jesus comes again. If that doesn't happen uh, before we die, <laughs> when Jesus comes again, then we'll all be reunited with our bodies, and it'll be our perfect bodies, like the best version of ourselves and um we'll be reunited with our bodies in heaven and we'll get to live um in a new heaven and a new earth um that comes when jesus comes again uh, so when we die we immediately get to go and live with with god in heaven but it things are a little bit different when jesus comes again and then we're reunited with our bodies uh new heaven and a new earth forever for all eternity it's gonna be great <laughs> So read what this new creation will be like in Revelation 21, uh, verses 1 through 8, and verses 22 to 27. So you can open up your Bible to that page, uh, to Revelation chapter 21, very last book of the Bible, towards the very end, one of the last chapters, not the very last chapter, the second to last chapter, <laughs> Revelation 21. And we'll start by reading verses 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away, uh, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the, older, the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water, from the spring of the water of life. 
Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So here we kind of get an image of what the new heaven and new earth will look like. Um, and I really like some of the things it mentions here. Like, God's dwelling place will be among the people. Um, so there won't be a separation between us and God. We'll be, like, with God in heaven. Um, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Um, so there will be no more reason to cry. Uh, no more sadness. It says, no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Could you imagine a world without any of those things? Um, that just sounds amazing. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Like, no more no more suffering, no more sadness, no more anything bad. It, it'll all be good um, in heaven, and it's going to be so great. <laughs> um, and so then we'll also go to verses 22 to 27. So if you go down, it's the last part of chapter 21. We'll start at uh, verse 22, if you want to read along. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nation will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of all the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So it's more uh, imagery of what heaven's gonna look like. Um, a little more pictures there. I think it's so interesting that um, there's no sun or moon to shine. Like, that's where we get our light now. And so there's going to be light in heaven, but it's not from the sun or the moon. It's God gives us light in heaven, which is interesting. It's kind of hard to imagine. Like, I don't know what that's, that's, what that's going to look like. <laughs> uh, and then nothing impure will be in heaven. It'll all, only be people whose names are written in the book of life, which are the believers in Jesus and, and God. Um, so only those who believe in God and believe in Jesus. Those are people who are going to be in heaven. Um, nothing impure, nothing evil, nothing bad, only good. <laughs> so great. Uh, also, Revelation 22, so the next chapter, uh, verses 1 through 5. So it's right after what we just read. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and, the uh, and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So, talks about again here, not being sun or needing for lamps or anything like that, because God will be our light, which is just so interesting, because um, God is the light, <laughs> light and life and truth and um, so great. Uh, so no sun, just no moon, no stars, just, <laughs> I can't imagine that, but that's cool. Um, and then also, um, it talks about the tree of life again, which, if you remember back from Genesis, uh, I don't know if we talked about this a whole lot, but there, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, and the tree of life is when you um, eat of it, you live forever. And so that's why God had to ban Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, because uh, if they ate of the tree of life, 
after eating of the a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, they would have been in that state forever, that sinful state. Um, and so God banished them from the garden to protect them from that. But now in heaven, there is not that danger of being in that sinful state anymore because we'll all be perfected um, in heaven. And so we'll be able to eat of the tree of life and live forever. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so there'll be the tree of life because we'll have eternal life and we'll get to live forever. Uh, which is kind of a cool tie back to Genesis, how in that tree of life there. Um, so th those are some images of what new creation will look like, the new heaven and a new earth that will come on that last day when Jesus comes again. And we'll all get to live there for all eternity. It's going to be so great. I can't wait. Looking forward to it. If you um, So you can take a moment and to try to draw a sketch or write down some words uh, that we just heard in those readings, some things that you think it might look like. Um, you can draw a picture if you want um, of what you think this new heaven, this new earth will look like, new creation. That will be on the last day. It's kind of tough to do. Uh, nobody really knows exactly what it's going to look like, but we do get some idea from what the Bible tells us. And really, I think it's it's awesome because it's actually going to be so much better than what we imagine. So even even the best possible scenario, even the best thing that we can imagine of this, this new creation, it's even better than that. It's even better than what we can even dream of. Uh, and it's where we're going to live with God for all eternity. Um, so it's going to be so great. It's going to be a party... I can't wait. <laughs> I'm very excited. Uh, and then in that last part of the box, it says, Jesus has done it all for you. This future is your free gift by the forgiveness of his grace. Read Revelation 22, verses 16 to 21 for Jesus' final words to us in the Bible. So I have it typed out here. This is Revelation 22, verses 16 to 21. I'll read it, and you can follow along. Um, the words, oh, by the way, the words written in red are words that are said by Jesus. So some Bibles actually do it this way, where everything that Jesus says is written in red. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's the case with your Bibles. Um, some Bibles do that. Not all Bibles do that. But um, they write what Jesus says in red. So we'll read along. Uh, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So here it's uh, Jesus saying more things uh, to John. And uh, in this middle part here, it talks about everyone who hears the words of the prophecy, don't add anything to them um, because God will add the plagues to you described in the scroll. And also, don't take words away from this prophecy. So this is talking about some people try to add things to the Bible that aren't there. Um, or they try to say, God said this, and God didn't say that. <laughs> um, so what it's saying is don't add things to God's word that aren't in God's word. And also, don't take away things from God's word that are in God's word. Because um, everything written in the Bible is important, and you don't want to take anything away from it. And you also don't want to add anything to it that God didn't say. So we want to stick to what is the real, true word of God, not words of other people. Um, so that's why the Bible is so important, because it's God's word. So we don't want to add anything to it that's not God's word, and we don't want to take anything away from it, because everything that God says in the Bible is important for us. Um, that's why the Bible is so important. Don't add or take anything away from it. Um, and then that last part... 
Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon. So this is kind of interesting. Um, Jesus says he's coming soon, and it's nobody really knows when soon is. We just know it's soon. And so we know that we should be prepared for when Jesus does come and not to fall asleep in our faith, not to, not to give up our faith uh, or to lose hope, but to always be ready for when Jesus comes. Um, because we know it'll be soon. We, we don't know when, but we know it'll be soon. So we hang on to the hope that Jesus is coming again. Um, and that we will be raised into heaven with him again and have eternal life. Um, so it might be during our lifetime, it might be before we die, or it might be after we die. Um, nobody really knows when. I'm not going to try to tell you when because I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to pretend I do. Um, but Jesus is coming again. We can hang on to that. Uh, so at the bottom of your page there, under the red box, I want you to write, Come, Lord Jesus. As it says right there, come Lord Jesus. And because that is something that we pray because it is our joy <clears throat> and our future hope as Christians. That we, uh, when we pray, come Lord Jesus, it's, it's a hope that we cling to. It's, it's something that we look forward to when Jesus comes again. And then our uh, last thing there that says think about it how will you continue to receive the gifts of God's word for life so I want you to think about that on um, this week because uh, even though uh, for some of you you may be finishing up confirmation um, but that doesn't mean that you're done with God's word um, it certainly certainly should not mean that um, you want to continue in God's word throughout your whole life because it's so important um, for all of us so just think about how you will continue to receive the gifts of God's word. How, how will you continue to remain in his word and remain connected to your faith and stay in that close relationship with God? How can you continue that even after we finish confirmation classes? As we go through the summer, as we go through this next year, these next few years, as you go throughout your schooling, how can you continue to stay connected to God? It's important. Don't neglect it. And then homework, of course. A uh, couple of assignments here. Unit 6 take-home test. Uh, I will email those to your parents tomorrow, and those will be due Wednesday, May 13th. So make sure to get those in by then. And then if you are in year 2 of confirmation, you will be meeting with Beth on Tuesday, May 12th. Uh, there will be more details about that in an email to your parents tomorrow, so um, tell them to look out for an email tomorrow. Uh, more details about that if you're in year two, if you're in year one, if you're sixth grade, uh, you don't have to worry about that until next year. <laughs> so those are your homework assignments. So uh, for those of you who are second year, we'll be meeting on May 12th uh, during our normal confirmation time, which is uh, 5 to 6.30, so make sure to block out that time on your schedule. But we'll set aside time for you to meet individually with um, Beth. There'll be more details about that in the email. And also, don't forget to do your test for everybody. Year one and year two, everybody does the test. All right, that is our last confirmation lesson in the book. So for those of you who are sixth grade, you are done except for the test. Make sure to do the test. Um, and if you get any wrong, there'll be corrections too. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are year two, you still have to do the test and uh, corrections and meeting with Beth. So, almost done at the end of the year. I hope you guys are doing okay with school and everything. Uh, for now, we'll uh, close in prayer. So you guys pray with me, please. Uh, dear God, we thank you for your word throughout all the scripture, um, throughout all the things that we hear about you and about Jesus that you sent your son to die for us. We thank you for the book of Revelation and the things that we learn there about the end times and the last day. Um, we thank you for all of those things. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent Jesus for us um, so that we can learn the truth, um, so that we can be saved through him, and so that we can live forever with you in heaven. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for this confirmation class throughout this year that we got to spend this time together. And we thank you for the good times. Um, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for joining me, guys. For those of you who are year two, I'll see you next week. And for those of you who are not, send me your tests. All right, bye.